recession for the first time since the latest period of continuous decline since records began, potentially one step closer to a double dip recession. Surveys from the Confederation of British Industry and British Chambers of Commerce suggest green shoots of recovery can be seen among the UK's private sector, with confidence picking up to its highest level in three years, boosting growth hopes. The 2014 growth forecast has been upgraded to 1.9% and the 2015 figure stands at 2.4%. I can create a network, control production and distribution. The point here is to make money, right? Why aren't we exploiting them? Because it's not our territory. Because we lack initiative. Initiative. Exponential growth, that's the key. You know the business. And I know the chemistry. Dom's telling me you can't hear, so I apologise for that. Um, anyway, who here's got a business plan? Hands up. Nobody with a business plan. Oh, we've got one at the back. Two at the back. Thank you. Um, you probably shouldn't bother. Most people have one, and if they do, it's because they want to. The only time I've ever written one is to get boards of directors to sign stuff off, which I wanted them to do, or to get money out of people. Um, and that's usually the purpose of a business plan. It doesn't give you a living, breathing strategy. It doesn't give you something that works on a day-to-day -day basis that you can communicate effectively. However, we do suggest that you have a plan. It's just a business plan in the traditional sense of uh, lots of numbers, but we believe you should have a strategic plan, and that's a plan that means something to you as a business owner. And I'll emphasize the, the living and breathing part. It should inspire you to drive your business forward. So it's also important to take some time out of your business. Most of the business owners that we work with are nose to the grindstone, working tremendously hard day in, day out. But work out what's in it for you. If I were a run-of-the-mill consultant, I'd say that this thing was about shareholder aspirations. Um, I don't talk in that language because no one knows what the hell you're talking about. Um, it's about you being selfish for once. Most of the business owners we work with are very poor at actually saying to themselves, what do I want out of the business? What's the goal for me? Business doctors are all small business owners and have run business, businesses in the past. So we understand that business is personal for a small business. So it's really important that you understand why you're in business. What gets you out of bed in the morning? What do you love doing? And what do you want out of your business for you in the longer term? So I'll give you a couple of examples. One I really love, it's just four words, and it's one business owner's shorthand for what he wants out of his business in the future. And his, his shorthand, his four words are, no shoes, no phone. That reminds him every day that in five years time, he wants to be running a business in a country where he doesn't need to wear shoes because it's warm enough, and that he won't be, in his words, overrun by the tyranny of emails on his mobile phone. So it's shorthand, no shoes, no phone, but it's a really powerful message for him. It reminds him every morning of why he's in business and what his aim is. Yeah, and I've got a client who wants to sell his business for £5 million inside three years, and it's five and three for him, and that's his shorthand. It's very simple. That kind of goal can help you set a strategy.
So I'm going to talk about values, which is always the point at which my small business owners go, oh God, that's so corporate. But actually, it is really important. Um, it's about your business DNA is one way of describing it. The way I look at it is it's more like your moral compass. What is it? What is really important to you? And this is about deciding what you're prepared to do to get the goal we just talked about. I've got business owners who are what I call pointillists. So they're on the on the perfection scale, the people who believe that getting it absolutely right is most important. For those guys, it's very important that they do not hire a sales director who's, who's so task orientated that getting it done counts much more than getting it right. Understanding that for your business before you start to grow it is really important. It's very easy to think of values of a business as maybe a bit airy-fairy, a bit uh, unnecessary, not business-like. But uh, actually, this is crucial to your business. It helps you understand yourself and to sell yourself. It, it establishes part of your brand. I saw a great quote the other day, which is that brand is not something decided on by a committee. It's what everyone in the business does day after day after day. It's what you do and the way you do it. And it's a very powerful aspect of business. It's really not airy-fairy. To give you an example, I've been working with a creative company recently and they needed to take on uh, a new staff member who needed to be crea a creative member of staff and who would work in the same way as the directors who set the business up. And by understanding what their own values were and communicating those effectively to the people they were interviewing, they were able to find somebody who they've taken on and has hit the ground running because they shared their business values. They understood what drove that particular business forward and wanted to share in it and contribute to it. So it's a very strong business tool in lots of ways. So this slide is about what business are you in? And I'll deal with the, the quote that's in the bottom um, right hand corner first. So Charles Revson Revson said, in our factories we make lipstick, in our advertising we sell hope. Um, I'm not sure he'd get away with saying that today, um, but he did. In order to level the score, um, the picture in the top left is a fat boy. Um, a Harley Davidson. Now, Harley Davidson, you might think are in the business of selling motorcycles. Um, they're not. They are in the business of selling freedom to fat middle-aged blokes. Okay? And understanding that is critical to setting a strategy for your business. If you are in the business of um, being a, a drill manufacturer, actually it's not the drill that people buy, it's knowing that they can generate a hole of the correct size and shape. Um, and I've got, I've got a manufacturing client who thought they were in the business of making um, specialist phones. They're not. They make protection for other people's products. Our, our mantra here, which we'd recommend you, you think about, follow, is think like a customer. Think not what you're selling to somebody, but think what they're buying from you. And often those two things are very different. You can look at it as features and benefits. Are you selling just the features of the thing you sell or the service you're offering? But actually, what are the benefits your customer is getting from you? So an example of business I'm working at the moment uh, are in the data connectivity business. So essentially, what do they sell? They sell lots of cables in their clients' offices. But actually, that's not what their clients are buying from them. They've realized that what their clients are buying from them is trouble-free, peace of mind, in enabling them to communicate internally and externally. And that knowledge, that understanding of what their customers are buying from them is incredibly powerful because again it comes back to branding and selling. It enables them to sell effectively because they're sending out the right message. They're not saying come and buy some cable from us because that, that's not what their customers are buying. So, are you ready to do this? In order to do this, you need to create a visionary goal. And that can take a lot of shapes and sizes. A visionary goal can be about, I want to do X, X amount of turnover at X level of margin. Uh, it's not necessarily the most inspiring one you'll ever have, um, but you could measure yourself as wanting to be compared to a competitor. My, famous, my, my favorite and most memorable uh, visionary goal was Caterpillars in the 1980s. Now, I know we're not allowed to do things the way we used to do it in the 1980s, but hey. Um, Caterpillar had a visionary goal that was two words, and it was kill Komatsu, um, which is one of their big competitors. But that's a very easy visionary goal to communicate to your staff, and everybody in that business bought into it. 
I, I particularly like Virgin Atlantics, given what they do. They're an airline, and given who they are founded by, Richard Branson, I suspect everybody here has at least an idea of what they think Richard Branson stands for. He's probably one of the best people in the world at establishing and maintaining a brand and establishing people's understanding of that brand. So Virgin Atlantic uh, mission statement is free the human spirit and let it fly. Again, that tells his staff a lot about what they're there to do and it tells customers a lot about what they're going to get from Virgin Atlantic. The fly part tells you, gives you a hint that it's an airline, you're going to buy airline tickets and the free the human spirit, I'm sure a lot of you will see immediately, there's a connection with Richard Branson himself and what he stands for. Your visionary goal should be stretching, it should, it should be ideally written down and we suggest that from an internal business point of view, it should be quite detailed. Where am I going to be in three years time? What might my turnover be? But it must be inspiring. How am I going to achieve it? What are, what are the business aspects? What are, my, what are the features of my business that will allow me to make that three million in five years time? Or whatever your visionary goal might be. Yeah, I've got another small client whose visionary goal is to be the number one design agency in West Kent. Right, and they and, and they, they want to measure that on basis of turnover and, and their recognition. And that's quite simple, but it means that the other people in that business can get behind it because they understand what it is. So step six is understanding there are opportunities everywhere. For the for the business students in the room, you may recognise this bit at the bottom as you know it could be reordered as a pest analysis if you want to do that. The point about this is taking through people through a process where they understand what the external impact on the business might be while you're building this plan. Because more often than not, that will show you opportunities, not threats. So you can find opportunities and easy wins and look at the market in terms of, not your marketplace in terms of who am I going to sell to, but everybody you touch. All of those people can help you provide routes into market. The other thing that's interesting is to think about not ranking your customers on the basis of how much they spend with you, but how much they really deliver in terms of value. And that may not necessarily be measured by margin. So who genuinely are your most valuable customers? I've got a manufacturing client who, when we started to analyse, they've got something like 3,000 customers. When we started to analyse the top 50, we discovered that of those top 50, over 20 were UK subsidiaries of foreign owned businesses that turned over 10 to 40 million pounds. They'd never spotted that before. That piece of information was critical in them building a sales plan. It gives them a very nice, neat, targeted focus to sell to. This kind of analysis can help you get there. At, at the other end of the scale to Chris, I'm working with a very small business. They're a domestic cleaning company. So they offer cleaning to people who have houses. And when we, when we started doing this analysis, we started to break down their customer base and the services they sold. At first glance, it seemed very simple. They only had two services. They offered regular cleans to people who wanted somebody to come into their house once a week, once a fortnight. And they offered one-off cleans. I'm, I'm based in Cambridge, so there are lots of students in Cambridge. And I suspect you can all imagine, if you've not even been in one, what a student house is like at the end of a term. It needs a nuclear clean, not just a deep clean. So the other service that my client offers is a one-off clean, which might take a whole day for two cleaners, or even two days, to really house top to bottom. And on the face of it, she just had those two types of service. But when we broke it down, actually those regular cleans were really interesting. She had some people who she would give three or four hours to once a week, and other clients who would only have a one or two hour clean once a month. And when we started to look at the administrative cost, involved in offering only two hours of paid work once a month, it became clear that she should focus on the clients who wanted three, four, five hours once a week because the margin was better. So thinking a bit more carefully about your customers, but also your suppliers, your staff, gives you, as Chris said, opportunities. There are some threats here, but crucially, there are opportunities. So look for those opportunities. So the next stage of the process is making sure you stand out, really understanding what makes you different. Um, most of the small business owners I work with are very poor at saying what they're good at. Um, it, might be, it might be that we're just a little bit English and Anglo-Saxon about it, so we're terribly good at beating ourselves up. 
they can give me any number in this exercise of places they can improve. But often we'll have discovered the greats earlier on in the process. And if you want to look for the greats and you don't know what they are, ask your customers, because they will tell you. But you have to ask them. They won't necessarily tell you spontaneously. But ask your customers, they'll give you what the great is. They'll tell you, go and ask you, you know, if you don't do anything else as a result of this seminar, go and ask some of your customers, what's the thing you most value about our service or our product or our business? And they will tell you, and that's your great right there. So that you can work out where you might be vulnerable and what your edge is. And some of you will recognise this as looking very like a SWOT analysis. And there's a reason for that, it's because it pretty much is. Again, to give you an example, where are we vulnerable? Back in the early 90s, I worked with a freight and logistics company, and we, we gave service to exporters and importers. And it was at a time when the US dollar exchange rate was rising. And we realized that the impact on our customers was that US, UK products became much more expensive for US buyers to buy. So on the face of it, there was a threat for us. But also, there was an opportunity because it also meant that UK companies could buy US products much more cheaply. So by simply swinging our focus and working with our import customers much more, who were doing more because they were buying more from the US, we were able to increase revenues and margins just by that simple shift. So there was an opportunity there. We didn't see it to start with. You just need to look for the opportunities. I really like these questions. Um, because they are, the, they are three crunch questions. What makes you different? What makes you better? And do we, as a business, pass the so what test? If you write, and it becomes very powerful when you start writing that down. Because if you can't pass a, well, this is what makes us different, and this is what makes us better, um, and it doesn't pass that test, then you don't really have a differentiated uh, positioning to take to market. It, if, you're, if you've been trading for five or ten years and you're still alive, the good news is it's in there, you just have to find it and identify it. The so what test, what do we actually mean by that? Taking you back to the previous slide, the, the give, the give analysis, where are we great, where can we improve, where are we vulnerable, what gives us our edge? When you start coming up with answers to those questions, apply the so what test to each of them. So a great example there is companies who tell you that they have an edge because they are a family company. Apply the so what test to that. What would a customer of that company say if they were told that they should buy from them because they were a family company? It might be really useful. So a family butchers, for instance, comes with connotations of longevity, reliability, trustworthiness, personal service. So in that circumstance, it might, it might truly give you the edge. But for just some companies providing some service, being a family business might cut no ice with customers. So apply the so what test. Does it make a difference to our customers, the things that we tell them? If it doesn't make any difference, forget it. It doesn't give you an edge. Okay, so coming up is the only consultancy triangle in the whole presentation. I think we did quite well there. Um, we talked earlier about the um, Gibbs analysis of finding your edge. Find your edge and stay out of the killing fields. Um, it's very attractive to a lot of businesses to start thinking about holding, especially in a recessionary environment, a lot of businesses I work with start focusing on how they can drive their costs down because their, their pressure is being applied by some customers um, to get them to drive prices down. Well, guess what? Those people are not your most valuable customers. People who will pay for the bits that take you along that that right-hand edge, they're the people who are your most valuable customers and they're the people who you should be focusing on. Most small businesses can find a place to live along this axis. It's quite difficult to be truly niche or truly differentiated, but you can do some bits of both of those. And even very large and very successful businesses, you start out here, can often get pushed into the killing fields. And Tesco's is a recent and obvious example of that. When they when they dominated the UK grocery market. And at one stage, Tesco was one pound in every eight pounds being spent in the whole of retail in the UK. Um, it ain't any more, and for a number of reasons, and mainly because they cannot maintain that position. And at the same time, they haven't done anything about being over here. Let me give you an example of a customer of ours who works somewhere along this edge, and I'll be interested to see from nods or shakes of the head where you think they are. 
The service they offer is renting out castles in Wales for holidays. So you could argue that they've got a niche. Castles in Wales, that's pretty unusual. Actually, you might argue that what they're doing is differentiating themselves. There's lots of companies offering holiday homes, holiday properties, but they're differentiating themselves by the fact that those holiday locations are actually castles in Wales. So where on that line are they? We're pretty sure they're somewhere. We think probably they're not quite in the niche. There are very few people lucky enough to have a really true niche who offer something that is totally, totally unique. If you can't find that totally, totally unique thing, you have to differentiate yourself to do what you do in a different way. Because if you're selling something and you're not the cheapest, you're not down here, and it's not something that nobody else has got, and the thing that you're doing that everybody else is doing, you don't do any differently from everybody else, you're here, and the question to ask yourself is, why would anybody buy from me? So step nine is surrounding yourself with the right people. And what do we mean by staying out of the owner's trap? Well, you may recognise these kind of things. If you, uh, if the owner's the person who interfaces with the customer who has all the key relationships, when they go on holiday and the revenue nosedives or things start to happen uh, that shouldn't be happening, then you're in the owner's trap for sure. And it's important to recognise that first. Uh, hub and spoke is another way of describing that, where I've seen a lot of businesses I've worked with where an org chart is presented with the MD at the top and other people and lots of people reporting into them and if it's 16 to 24 people actually it's not like that at all and I've presented them back with an org chart that shows somebody in the middle and everybody else spoking off that. You have to break out of that uh, to develop the business. Recently put an operations director into a, a business that grew from 3 to 4 million turnover last year but it won't get any bigger unless they bring somebody external into that senior management team and that's what they finally decided to break the mould and do. And it's really important that you can take that step. A recent example is uh, where the, the owner's trap is, is a difficult place to be. I was working with a creative company, uh, two directors, and one of them very creative, very driven, very focused, and very perfectionist. And it got to a point where work went out of the door that either he hadn't looked at at all, or he would look at and take away completely from people he tried to delegate it to and redo it. Obviously that wasn't a good place to be and he hadn't effectively communicated to his staff what he needed from them. So it was very difficult for him to improve that situation. By looking at values that we talked about earlier, we were able to improve the position on his delegation and therefore the, the, the profitability of the company. They were able to yield more because they had more people working on what they actually sold. So step 10 is about pressing the reset button. Um, a lot of you will, will recognise all of these R's, you'd have seen it all before. What does that really mean? Well, it's about the, the phrase at the bottom, what gets measured gets done. And I work with a publisher client who's now 30% up year on year. They're absolutely flying and part of the reason for that is they're now measuring their long-term revenue and they're driving that rather than worrying about filling the hopper each month because it's, it's an advertising sales business and the, what happens is the intensity is very high to make a monthly number each month. But they, in order to break out of that, they had to start viewing the long-term long -term goal. And they put that on the whiteboard and the salespeople could all see it and they tied the incentive program around that long-term goal and now they spend a lot less time worrying about the short-term goal because they know it will be looked after by the work they're doing on the long-term goal. It's about measuring the right things. And Chris's point there is crucial. What are the right things? You all know Marks and Spencers. The main board of Marks and Spencers runs their entire business on a number of KPIs, key performance indicators. Does anybody want to put a hand in the air with a number of fingers to show me how many KPIs you think they use? Any clues? It's six. The whole of Marks and Spencers is driven by just six measures. They only look at six things each month at their management meetings and that drives the business. As long as you get those six measures right, they've got to be key measures, but as long as you get them right, five, six, seven, is probably about the right number. Because we're all pretty simple people, we can't actually focus on many more than that. Find the right ones and focus on them. Yeah, thanks Tom. So, 
These last two slides are a little bit about the service. What we've what we been talking about is the 10-step programme to building yourself a, a, a good strategy, which you can do with or without us. You're welcome to try on your own. Um, that's completely fine. Um, if you want to find out how scalable your business is, you can go to our website or come and speak to some of the guys who are on the stand just there. Um, and, and they can walk you through that. I'm not going to bang on endlessly about that, that one. We, we, can help, we can help you do this number of things if you want to do them, but it's got to be the right time for you. Our business isn't about us, it's about you guys, and it's about the, the clients we work for. So, as I say, if you're interested, come and have a chat with us later. On the uh, right-hand side of your slide there, there's a picture of a book we've just brought out called Breaking Big, of course, based on the TV show Breaking Bad. Uh, on our stand over there, we are having a draw to give away a copy of the book today and another one tomorrow. Uh, so we've got a bowl to put business cards in. Come on over and give us your card. And you never know, you might win the book. If not, we'll sell it to you at half price today.